Hello and welcome to RPG Research. I'm your host and uh, founder of RPG Research, Hawk Robinson. Today is December 17th, 2019, 9.58 a.m. Pacific Time. This is our weekly Tuesday researchers meeting. Joining me remotely, also in Spokane, is Eric. Good morning, Eric. Good morning. So, um, today, uh, so this week we kind of circled back on our topic of training back to the core model for the quiz and everything, both to refresh for those who it's been a, a couple of months since we went over it, and because we've had some additions and enhancements to it. Uh, uh, so if we want to get out a piece of paper and a pencil and test and see what's stuck for you, you, you should be able to get most of this. However, there are a few new tidbits. And then after that, we will do our admin meeting. We're going to talk about brain-computer interface stuff. Uh, for uh, today's meeting. I've got some updates on that that will be interesting. I was hoping we could do some hands-on demos, uh, but people's schedules didn't work out this time around. So with the Christmas holiday coming, it'll be a couple of weeks before we can do that. Um, I'm, I may have to do it. I was hoping to do it with the research team before doing it in the general population um, uh, this coming Sunday and Monday, but I, I guess I'll have to do it on them first. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then we'll circle back to the researchers group. Usually the researchers get to do stuff first, um, but I'm kind of anxious to get this wrong because I'm I'm proposing that we have a BCI gaming table at Gen Con, and so I'm trying to find all of the uh, applicable tabletop options for that, uh, so that you know we can we can demo the the video game part as well. But you know Gen Con is about tabletop games, so I want to make sure that the BCI table has both tabletop and uh, video game options so that, that hopefully that will be allowed. But we'll, we'll talk about that a little later in the administrative section. So, do you have something ready to write down for the quiz? I do indeed. Okay, give me a minute here to pull up. I seem to have misplaced the folder I was in for the latest version of the quiz. Let me go back. Let's see. There's... That's training. Um, well, it should be here. Okay, agenda. That looks like almost there. There it is. 20, December 16th. All right, let's make this our next newest one. All right, question number one. Oh, nope, that's the wrong one. I keep getting tricked by this one. Hang on. I've got some files in here that keep tricking me. I've got to clean out some cruft. Question number one. Trick question. Yeah. All right, try this one. Is this the one I updated yesterday? Yes. Okay, so I'll update this one. 12, All right. Um, according to the Hawks Robinson RPG model at RPGmodel.com, what are the four letter acronyms of the four major RPG formats and what does each stand for? So, most of this should be pretty easy for you by now, Eric. But there's a few new tidbits that will be new for you. And then later we'll talk about the BCI stuff. Okay. Number two, according to this model, what's the most well known sub subtype of the live action format? According to the Oxford English Dictionary, as of 2012, this is now a word and no longer a four letter acronym. Right. Number three, according to the model, what are two common sub-subtype branches of the live-action subtype, usually indicated by the type of interaction slash activity between players? Okay. Number four, what are the two extreme ends of the spectra for the combat type? Uh, 
Number five, specify two specific game system examples of the buffer combat uh, type. Names, these are the names of the games. Number six, supply a specific game system as an example of the salon type. Okay. Number seven, what are two notable subtypes of the electronic format? Number eight, provide one example of a specific CRPG we like to use a lot. How easy is that one now? <laughs> Number nine, so this has gotten enhanced a little bit because I've been able to expand it finally. Provide three example audio RPGs. Remember I only had one for you before? Yep. One from Greece, so you should know that one. Uh -huh. One f on Google Play and a third on Amazon Kindle through Alexa, which just came out this summer. All right. Number 10, what are the two text-only, choice-based, notable subtypes of the hybrid format? So this is related to publication format and content. One is a four-letter acronym. The other is a two-letter acronym. Acronym. So these are, you know, printed, paper, text only, choice based, notable subtypes of the hybrid format related to publication format and content. One's a four letter acronym and the other is a two letter acronym. Let me know when you're ready. Which one are you struggling with? Mm, I think I got it. Okay. I think I got it. Number, <laughs> number 11. What are the acronyms and full meaning of the two variants of the SABM? Hint, they are each three letter acronyms. Number 12, provide one example product line title of each of those two variants of the SABM. Number 13, what are two of the most well-known examples of the IF text-only subtype? One is electronic, the other in printed paper book format. Sorry, say the first part of that again. What are two of the most well-known examples of the IF Text only subtype. One is electronic, the other in printed paper book format. Okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Number 14. This one, I really need to somehow improve the phrasing, it seems. What are three other typical hybrid subtypes that use completely different interaction methods? from the SABM and IF formats. Problem is it's too technical according to the others. But I haven't really figured out how to make that clear yet. In hindsight it makes total sense to them 
but it isn't working on the neuro cues. Let's see if it works for you. So imagine the hybrid branch, and you and you have SABM and IF on one side. Now imagine uh, away from that, the other interaction methods of games that are outside of role playing gaming. That you know sometimes bleed into role playing gaming and such, but they're quite different than SABM and IF. I think I got it. Okay, number fifteen. For brevity, clarity, and pedantic accuracy, what are the two preferred acronyms to use when used listing only tabletop role-playing games and not discussing other formats? One is a three-letter acronym, the other is a four-letter acronym. All right. <laughs> For brevity, clarity, consistency, and pedantic accuracy, despite recent social media debate at RPG Research, what acronym is not used when referencing a tabletop role-playing game? It's five letters. Okay. Number 17. The most well-known diceless RPG is called what? Uh, yep, yeah, sure. Oh, I just wrote down the first thing that came to mind. Okay. Probably not correct. Number 18. What are two modern diceless RPG settings based on the original diceless system? Number 19, uh, what is the current status on BCI role-playing games? Okay. Okay, that's it for now. Um, give me just a second to pull something up here. Oh, darn it, I'm jumping around on me here. All right. So, number one, what'd you have? Uh, ERPG, LRPG, TRPG, and HRPG. And what do they stand for? Electronic, live action, tabletop, and hybrid RPGs. Excellent. Number two? LARP. Excellent. RP. Yep. Number three? Uh, combat, non-combat. Excellent. What's another word for non-combat? That the, the LARPers salon. use. Yes, salon, good. But but non combat's perfectly non combat's completely uh, totally acceptable. That's just uh, knowing that term is, is useful too. Okay. Oh man. I am just clumsy this morning. Spilling everywhere. Um, number four, what are the two extreme ends of the spectra for the combat type? Soft. That's it. Very good. Very much like uh, martial arts styles in general. <laughs> yeah. Very much so. Uh, supply two specific game system examples of the buffer combat type. Name of the games. Uh, Nero and Amptgard. Excellent. Uh, others are acceptable, but those are here in the Northwest and such, and popular in the U.S. Supply a specific game system as an example of the salon type. Uh, vampire. Masquerade? Yep. Uh, the system is Mind's Eye Theater, and Vampire the Masquerade is one of the setting, one of the, the subsets, but that's fine. Vampire is, is the ex expected answer. Okay. Mind's Eye Theater is the kind of the system. Number seven. It's the publisher slash system. Number seven. According to the model, what are two notable subtypes of the electronic uh, format? CRPG and ARPG, computer and audio. You got it. Provide one example of a specific CRPG we like to use a lot. Neverwinter Nights. 
Yep. Number nine. Uh, provide three example audio RPGs, one from Greece, one on Google Play, and a third on Amazon Kindle through Alexa. What'd you have? I have Kronos. Yep. I'm not sure the second one, but the third one, I believe, is the Skyrim audio RPG. Nope. There's, oh, a, really? there's a Skyrim audio RPG? Yeah, through Alexa. Oh, I didn't know about that one, so I gotta add that to the list. Hang on a second here. But you know, a mighty adventure like you wouldn't have to ask, check my health, because that'd be ridiculous. You're too strong and powerful for that. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so yeah, the Greek one is Kronos, with a K. Yeah. On Google Play... You can get the audio RPG, uh, kind of. it's kind of blank choice. Wizard's choice is one. Ranger's choice is another. So that's what your character is, is your is the class. And then it's an audio-based... Uh, what's, that, what's that? Classes choice. Basically, yeah. I mean, so um, I'm learning more about it. It's a little buggy on the audio interface. Um, not all the devices have worked properly with the audio, so sometimes I've had to swipe and such. But... That's its intention. It just needs to be debugged further, uh, but it's uh, but that's through Google Play, and then on Amazon Kindle, Dungeon Adventure Skill. So this was just released this summer. So there's skills. Alexa has skills, which are special features that you can enable, and all you have to do is say, Alexa, play Dungeon Adventure Skill, and it will start with telling you, you know, that you're an adventurer and let's roll your stats, and it will roll stats by audio. Oh, there we go, because I brought down one of the Alexas down here, so it's at trying to activate. Um, but it's all, it's all, I don't have it on the internet right now. So normally I have all those disabled, but I brought them down here to demonstrate. So let me pull that out of my bag. I've got a, uh, a bag here now that I've been setting aside for BCI and such. Let me pull this one out. Okay, I don't think this is on the network, so let me... Okay. No, that's not the right one. Oh, the battery's low. Great. Which charger does this use? Regular. I have to deal with that soon. Um, Alexa, play Dungeon Adventure Skill. Welcome back to Dungeon Adventure. Join us on Facebook under Alexa Dungeon Adventure for news and tips. I see you're back to save the town from the evil necromancer. Now all you need to do is find him in the dungeon and slay him and make it back to town alive. I hope you're up for the task. Good luck. You are in the town center. You see a tavern, inn, blacksmith, magic shop, and temple. In the town you notice many different types of villagers going about their daily business. What would you like to do? Go to blacksmith. You walk into the town blacksmith armory and weapon shop. There is a blacksmith working at a forge. There are various weapons and armor hanging on the walls that are for sale. So, you get the idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Skyrim RPG is somewhat similar to that as well. I'll have to check that one. I wasn't aware of that. So, it seems to be fairly recently that these are catching on again. Cause, so, remember, they were around in the 70s and 80s on 8-track cassettes. <laughs> You had to track your stats yourself on paper, but the games were played all by audio, and then you'd push buttons for your choices. Um, yeah, so we've... Uh, okay, man, I way too many windows open on here. Okay, so it, it's called Skyrim Audio RPG? Um, I'm not sure. Let's do a little search here. It's an Alexa. It might just be a Skyrim skill for Alexa as well. Uh, Skyrim, very special edition Alexa skills. Oh, yes. Very special edition. That's what it is. Bethesda Game Studios is proud to present Skyrim for Alexa. That's right. The version of Skyrim you never saw coming has arrived. Uh, when did this come out? Uh, last year, 2018. Interesting. I just, I just discovered it. All right, well, let me try activating that. Let's see here. Alexa, 
Play Skyrim Very Special Edition Skill. Okay, here's Skyrim Very Special Edition. Skyrim Very Special Edition contains mature content that may not be suitable for all ages. Would you like to continue? Yes. Welcome back to Skyrim, Adventurer. You were standing at a crossroads deciding where to go. In one direction is a busy trading post, in the other is a bustling tavern. Where would you like to go? So apparently I've played it. <laughs> I just don't remember it because it's it's picking up from where I left off. Is is the dungeon adventure an overlap of... No, because that was a different location. I think that's how it starts you. I think it just throws you straight in. Oh, because it said welcome back to. Oh, did it? Yeah, it said welcome back. So I'll have to... I'll try it. I've got another Kindle to, to try that I haven't, you know, that's newer. And I'll see on that one if it says the same thing or not. But I'm going to add that to the list. Excellent. Thank you. Any others you're aware of? <laughs> no. Nope, okay. This time. I wouldn't be surprised if there's more uh, going on in the Amazon world. Let me see about the Wizard's Choice one here. Yeah, so Wizard's Choice uh, apps on Google Play. Um, let me open up the Play Store. So there's a simple hack to put Google Play on a Kindle, which makes it a much more useful device, right? Because you're not limited to the Amazon. E uh, so it's by Delight Games. Unfortunately, it does contain ads, has in-app purchase, uh, purchases, has a 4.8 stars out of 24,000 reviews, over 100,000 downloads. Appropriate for ages 10 on up. Uh, read, make choices, unlock achievements in this medieval RPG. Um, no, you know what? This doesn't look right. Because this one is... I don't think this is the right one. It's full of graphics. I don't think... Let me double check. I don't think this is the right one. It might be the same people... But it, it looks more like their text version. Series of RPG interactive novels. Now, you could probably enable accessibility to play them, maybe. But let me try... What? Oh, well, now it's giving me an authentication error. Come on. So now let me try Wizard's Choice Audio. RPG. I've got it on my other Kindle, which I need to go grab. Audio game, Wizard's Choice. Okay, so you have to look under Audio Game, Wizard's Choice, on the Google Play Store. And there it is. That's it. It's still by Delight Games, so same people. Still over 10,000 downloads, ages 10 on up. So it's an audio version. Um, so it's not on this tablet. Let's see if I can get it. And the only thing it needs to access to is your microphone. That's nice. You know, instead of the 10,000 things they need access to. Choice game library. So they look like they got a whole library of stuff. Wait for this to finish. Uh, it's running a little slow. Uh, massive collection of interactive stories. So they've got a whole bunch of these types of interactive stories. Um, I have to figure out how many, but I'm pretty sure they also have like Ranger's Choice um, and a few others. I believe. I, I know they have at least those two that, that I've seen. Beyond that, I'm not certain. There it is. Rogue's Choice. Detective's Choice. Alice in Demon Land, <laughs> Ranger's Choice. So I'm not sure how many of these are audio is the only thing. I'll have to delve into that some more. Because it looks like this Wizard's Choice might, it, it might be, it's different because it's flagged for audio game. So let me just try audio game. Because that's how I stumbled across it. There's Audio Wizards, Accessible Audio Game, Audio Game Wizards Choice 2. Oh, okay, there's a second one. I'll check that one out. Maybe it works better. Um, Blindscape? 
experimental storytelling game that takes place entirely through sound. I recall hearing about that one. I need to uh, check that one. It's also got a lot of reviews. Explore a world in the role of a blind protagonist. See with your ears. The screen is just blank. <laughs> so, so yeah, so there's a few out there now. Here's the other thing I wanted to check. Oh, come on. Ah. So I was just looking under Google Play for brain computer interface and BCI stuff. And they're all just brain training games or uh, uh, the bineural, uh, the audio, um, uh, what do they call that? Uh, that was the other page. Binaural beats and such, you know, those things, which is different. <clears throat> So anyway, as far as I know, the only uh, anyway. So we'll move on, but that's uh, great. We get to keep adding to that list because that's wonderful for accessibility. <coughs> Number ten, uh, four letter and two letter acronyms. Uh, S A B M and I F. You got it. What are the three? Uh, number eleven, the three letter acronyms. S A B and S A M. And they stand for. Soul Adventure Books and Soul Adventure Modules. You got it. Number 12, the examples. Uh, for Soul Adventure Books, I have Lone Wolf. Good. And Adventure Modules, I have Call of Cthulhu alone in the wherever, in the dark. Or yeah, it's Against the Dark or uh, Alone Against the Flames. Against so, the dark. Yeah, so Alone Against the Flames alone is a... Alone Against. Yeah. Alone Against the Flames is a module you can play in a single session, like three hour, two or three, four hours or so. Alone Against the Dark is a solo campaign. Okay. Yeah, and then of course there's the Frank Mentzer Beck Me Basic, uh, you know, module those those adventures in the rule book. But yeah, uh, uh, but S A B for Lone Wolf that's what's in print. Out of print we've got Tolkien Quest or Middle Earth Quest, etc. Number thirteen, what do you have? For IF text subtypes, electronic and printed. I have Zork and Choose Your Own Adventure. Books. You got it. That's correct. Nailed it. Cool. Number 14. Uh, the three weird ones. Card-based, board game-based, and live-action war game. You nailed it. Yes. Yeah. All right. So... Maybe it's just the other people have issues. <laughs> it made it made sense to you, so that's good. All right. Uh, and then the three and four letter acronyms for number fifteen. Uh, RPG and TRPG. Yep. And number sixteen, the five letter acronym not to use. TTRPG. Uh, so Joe, my new brother in law, who just joined the team uh, yesterday, is training. When we got to this, he went I E T T R P G. Uh, like he started adding all these extra acronyms to say like interactive, uh, experiential, cooperative. Like putting uh, just to make it as long as you know, obnoxiously could <laughs> to still describe a tabletop role playing game. <laughs> so he's a professional uh, improv comic. He's a, a lead instructor at uh, Seattle Jet City for like a decade and a half. Um, so he, he is a hoot. <laughs> he was just, he's like, oh, that's a challenge. <laughs> so he's tried to make it way more than just five letter acronym for the same meaning. <laughs> oh, anyway, number 17. Uh, what'd you have for the most well-known diceless RPG? Uh, I wasn't sure, but I, I put Amber Diceless. That's correct. Oh, cool. 
that's why, as I say, it's well known. <laughs> Even though almost nobody's played it. I have, but very few people I've run into have actually played it. Uh, we, we've now moved that in, uh, higher up the, so it's earlier in training just so people get some experience. The problem, reason why I haven't had it as part of the training is because it's actually very competitive. It's much more... Um, so whereas tabletop role-playing game is a non-zero-sum game, diceless are actually zero-sum games. You, you have to take points from each other to, to work your way up and such. It's, it, it, it's all about building and, and dealing with rivalry. So that's why I don't use it with our at-risk populations and such. Uh, number 18, What did you, you probably didn't know this because it's new info. Yeah, I have question mark, question mark. Yeah, that's perfectly okay. So the new one, and this is, they did it in coordination with all the authors of the original one, and then the original author died, so they kind of shaved off the serial numbers, but it's, it's still basically, the same, it's basically version two of Amber Diceless. Is called Lords of Gossamer and Shadow. So spider webs and you know shade, but Lords of Gossamer and Shadow. So that's that's basically Amber Two, except they've had to shave off all the trademark stuff. Okay. Um, and then uh, the other one that's more accessible to a wider population, if you haven't read the Robert Zelazny Amber books, is Lords of Olympus, which is set in a Greek mythology setting. So you're children of the gods, and you're all vying for power and all of that. Whereas Amber is, you know, a, a multi is a bunch of gods in a multiverse setting. So yeah, Lords of Gossamer and Shadow, that's the closest one to Amber, and then Lords of Olympus, which is a Greek setting. Greek mythology setting. And we will be training folks briefly on those. We don't intend to use them in our community programs, but we may use them in Gen Con. Uh, number 19, what is the current status on BCI RPGs? I have in development. <laughs> <laughs> to date, unknown of any existing except the current efforts at RPG research through Project Ilmatar and hopefully partnership with the uh, BCI Brain Jam folks in, in Calgary. They don't have a, another name, do they, besides, I don't know what to call them as a group. Uh, we are trying to eventually incorporate as Neural Matrix Entertainment. Oh, okay, that was, okay. So with the neural or just anime for short. <laughs> entertainment NME, and then I'll put in parentheses BCI Brain Jam folks in Calgary. So I hope we will have a growing close relationship together. All right, so that's that one. Questions, comments on that? Um, nothing up front. Okay. No, nope, you did well. It's it's sticking. <laughs> That's the good thing. It's getting better. Yeah. No, you 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 got all of them. How I mean that that you could have known, right? The others and, and even some that you hadn't been through before, like Amber, you nailed it. So did great. Did very well. I'm glad. I'm glad all this time here hasn't been for not. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> and I blame more myself if it wasn't working uh, than the you know. Because I'm trying to make it so that, you know, it just works. As long as you just attend and participate, you can't help but absorb it. That's what we're trying to make happen with this learning process. So um, so that's good. All right. So, speaking of BCI, <clears throat> um, I did get another add-on to the collection that I was really hoping you were going to be here for, which you'll have to get down here at some point. Because I got the other one. So remember I had the Mind Flex? Well, I tracked down a used version, I hope it works, of Mind Flex Duel. So that's the two player one. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Now, normally it's like $250, and I tracked it down for about 70 bucks. And it claims it's in great, you know, complete and fully working. We will find out. But I need somebody else to test it with. <laughs> So I'll have to do it with the other group. So so I got it here, and um, and I'll be setting these up for Sunday's group. So I'll have the single one and then the, the two-player one have those set up here. And I was going to pick up some of the Star Wars Jedi training, but there's a video from a guy claiming that they're complete fakes. Really? 
really. So, so if you look on YouTube, and if you look up, hey, well, um, let's see. So it's uh, Star Wars, mm, Jedi Mind Training Fake, is that the one? Uh, no, that's not it. Uh, what do they call it? There, there, there's a name, Training game it, it so jedi challenges okay oh no that's the vr headset that's not what i'm looking for i've got that um gosh darn i had all this up and i closed out my browser because it was a while ago uh okay let's just try for it i think it was force training i think that was it Yes, uh, Force Trainer 2. So if you type in Star Wars Force Training Fake, you'll see a video on YouTube that he this person talks about it. And it shows this, you know, it's it's fake 3D imagery, but it, it's fake uh, hologram. And nothing wrong with that. That's not the and issue. Uncle so, so it's from Uncle Milton. So, so it claims to be EEG neurofeedback. But he... He played the game by not watching any of it while reading a book and then doing other stuff and then talking, trying different things, and got the exact same results. And then ultimately, he tried just hooking the two electrodes up to each other, not to his head at all. And the game played itself through all nine levels to completion. <laughs> uh, whoops. Whoops. <laughs> so he thinks there's some sort of randomized program to make it seem like, you know, but... But I can't find any confirmation about his claims. And this video is clear back in 2017. And um, yeah, so so because of that, I'm holding off. I want to figure out but, and 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 the game company's not responding to the claims at all, one way or the other, either saying because it's an expensive game. It's like 150 bucks. Right, if it's a twenty dollar toy, you'd expect it to be a fake, right? You just like, oh, it's a nice idea, isn't that cute, and no big deal. But no, this is an expensive to toy, uh, um, and it claims to be EEG based, but that's kind of problematic. So I have to do more research. I only stumbled across that. What's that? Apparently, those claims are wildly inaccurate. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, what, what? It'd be interesting to see if it was... Yeah, no, I'm, like, really intrigued now. So I, I, I just read that a couple of days ago when I was looking at trying to get some used, um, copies of those games for the tabletop thing, because, again, I want to propose to the Gen Con folks that we have a whole BCI tabletop games section, you know, which would include the, the video games, but I want to make sure there's some tabletop element. And Star Wars has gone gung ho with a bunch of these, right? They got three or four of these things that claim to be EEG based. But now I'm hesitant to do that until I'm more confident that it's not fake. Although, you know, if I could find something that was affordable, I'd get it even if it was fake for us to do our own testing. Right? It's just. It would be very interesting to see. If yeah. It was yeah. Fake. Yeah. We can totally figure that out pretty quickly if if it's that simple um oh wait the price has whoa the price has dropped i might have to buy it now it's normally over 110 dollars right now 22.93 oh, i think wow. somebody got busted <laughs> a pack of three for 90 bucks that's pretty rough so i wonder if they're cleaning out because they've gotten busted <laughs> so i'm gonna pick it up then because for that price it helps for our research to you know to show hey watch out for these fake things if it is fake hmm. yeah that's not good for them good for us <laughs> right yeah <laughs> Because it still says n normally one oh nine. Hurry and get today before, and it'll be twenty two ninety three. 
<laughs> That's the Star Wars Science Force Trainer 2 brain sensing hologram electro electronic game. Works with select iPad and Android tablets. Uh, train like a Jedi. Use your own mind to control the movements of a tablet projected hologram. Works with the same innovative brain sensing EEG technology used in medical and military devices. You wear a headset and everything. Feel the Force awaken in you with the ultimate experience for Star Wars fans of all ages. Bring the world of Luke, Yoda, and Darth Vader into reality more fully than other games or action figures. See if you can become a Jedi Master like your own Jedi Academy. Train your powers of concentration through 25-plus levels, from battling droids to levitating an X-Wing with real Star Wars music, sound effects, and instruction from Master Yoda. More than a toy or game, this interactive science-based experience can be enjoyed together for hours by families and fans of all ages. Inspires STEM-based learning and education through Star Wars. Includes Bluetooth brain-sensing headset, training base, app, download on App Store or Google Play, and science learning poster. Requires iPad or Android tablet not included. Does not include. Does not work with Kindle or iPad Mini. Oh, that's important to know. Although that might be, you just need to hack the Google Play thing. Part of the Uncle Milton Star Wars Science brand of science-based toys and collectibles that connect the Star Wars world to our own, such as lab kits, build-your-own lightsabers, projectors, and more. Some assembly required, instruction included. If you have any problems with assembly or app setup, contact Uncle Milton Customer Service for assistance. Since 1946, Un Uncle Milton has created innovative products that inspire imagination and learning while encouraging kids to explore and discover their world. Now, if it is actual working EEG equipment for $22.93, bucks, we could hack the crap out of it. <laughs> it seems sort of suspicious, though, doesn't it? Yes, it does, that the price has uh, dropped so much, so suddenly, I mean, interestingly. Um you know, and then they got this whole force armband thing, and they got a whole slew of these different force simulator things. It's kind of interesting. Um, It'd be interesting to evaluate and see which exactly, one is actual. Exactly. Because there's the other one. The very simple one was that hovering ball in a tube that I wanted to track down that one as well. That was their earliest venture, I think, into it. And I can't remember. Let's see. Star Wars. No. Oh my goodness, it, yeah, I've had trouble finding it, saying Star Wars. Okay, that was the old Force Trainer 1, that was just that ball in the tube. And it just, it works in a similar principle to the Mind Flex. Um... Game Force Trainer. There it is. Holy crap. So I guess it's n new version's not available, so now it's overpriced. Because th that one's $368. <laughs> that's, that's pretty <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and that's on Amazon. Um, and that's, this is the, the, the original Star Wars Science Force Trainer. Wish I'd bought it when it was out, because I think it was like four, 30 bucks or something originally. Yeah, 368.95, that's insane. And it just, it's just a ball that goes up and down, you know, supposedly with your focus. You know, Mindflex does a bit. You know, does basically the same thing except you can move it around with the little the little turning thing and stuff. 
Um, <clears throat> yep, should have snagged it while I was around because now it's outrageously priced. You never know with those kind of things either. Yeah. Yep. Do or do not, there is no try. So, yeah. All right. Well, anyway, I'll snag the other one so that we can check it out. See what kind of stuff's actually going on there. Trying to make sure it's on smile at Amazon.com so it gets donated RPG research. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh-huh. I mean, that is that is important. It is. Do all your Christmas shopping through smile at Amazon.com and select RPG Research as your charity. Alright, that has ordered it'll get here like a day or two before Christmas Eve if if all goes well, but that's okay. So when after Christmas break you'll have to come up here and try out the, the goodies. Okay. So, meanwhile, here's what's happened with the Open EEG and Open BCI world. I don't know how much you've been following it. You know, I've been following it for over 10 years, no, almost 15 years. Uh, darn European regulators are starting to get in the way. So, uh, of, of the two Open EEG manufacturers that you could buy from, so there was... Um, you, you could buy fairly inexpensive uh, EEG, BCI type equipment that was open EEG compatible um, through uh, Olamex and Minefield. And Olamex is still around, pretty much the same equipment, pretty much the same price in euros, etc. Um, Minefield started having hassles from... So the mine, the Mine Master EEG from Minefield Biosystems Limited, was actually uh, eventually became medically certified EN six zero six zero one CE, uh, a redesign of the modular EEG circuit done by Hjorg Hansman from Minefield Biosystems. Uh, firmware is P two downwards compatible. Um, a complete ready to go system with everything included. Uh, it was just two EE channels with four four electrodes plus one DRL electrode. 0 0.5 uh, um, microvolts per P resolution, blah, blah, blah. Uh, USB port, impedance mode, auto calibration, medical grade isolation of EEG ports from USB port, ESD protection up to plus minus 15 kilovolts according to human body model, IEC 1042, air gap discharge in any port, test and certified EMI RFI protection, uh, complete risk management, etc. So, it was it was a little pricier, but um, you know it was it was higher quality, uh, and well, then it says later, due to medical guidelines, the Mindmaster EEG for now is only available for German and Austrian customers. Also, the Mindmaster EEG can be ordered only from customers with shipping addresses in Germany or Austria. And now. Yeah, so that's unfortunate. And it looks like they've kind of... So now the English site is dead. Just the German site is around in German, which they've got a bunch of MindMaster products, but of course I can't get them. That's a bit of an issue. Yeah. Um, and it looks like they're really commercial now, whereas before they were much more community driven. They've become they're very commercial products now, and they've got MindMaster Bio, MindMaster Neuro, MindMaster Bio Neuro. Um, I'm trying to see what they're talking price points here, because I'm having a little bit of trouble getting that. So there's their shop. 
So the Olamec stuff is pretty much the same. It hasn't really advanced, but at least it's inexpensive, right? It was 99 euros for that basic uh, five-port unit. And, uh, yeah, that's not bad at all. Right. You know, and it, again, and then you can maybe theoretically daisy, you know, put a couple of them on a couple of USB ports to get more ports. I don't know. I've never tried, but I think that would be possible. Um, so I'm trying to find pricing on the devices here. Come on. Oh, but there's stores in English. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Huh. Come on. What's the pro holy crap? Okay, so they were they were definitely pricier than the Olamex, but what a change. They're now this is in Euros between fifty five hundred to eight thousand Euros. That's uh astounding difference yeah so then there's open bci so that is a more modern group and they've got more modern tech um and looks really cool and they've got eight and 16 channel units right and i'm trying to see let's see well, how many channels is this one give me the page back this looks like these are all of these mind master ones look like they are probably eight channel what is this two channel eight electrodes or something like that but then the open bci one let me get back to there by cyton so they've also become they were they were very community driven as well now they look really commercial pretty much keeps redirecting you to the open bci shop now their software is still open source so you can get all the open bci software but it keeps saying it's meant for the open bci hardware which you can get a, a four-channel board for about 250 bucks with, without the electrodes. It, it's compatible, so it's just the board. And then you got to get their EEG headband kit, their gold cup electrodes, their EMG ECG snap electrode cables, header pin to touch-proof uh, electrode adapter, uh, and then they've got a tutorial, etc. But still, that's, you know, it, that's achievable, right? Buy a piece at a time, put it together. Then they've got some bundles that get you there quicker if you've got the money, which it's a little more than I can do right now. But they're pretty cool. They got a... Oh, I better plug in my laptop if I remembered my power cord. Where did I put it? There it is. Hang on a minute. Now, those of you watching for RPG Research, what does this have to do with RPGs? Well, I, I really... We have a project developing an electronic role-playing game that we are keeping it designed f to be as accessible as possible. So that includes support for brain-computer interfaces and VR and AR support as well down the road. Um, and so this is a key thing, is, is knowing what, what APIs we're going to make sure it's compatible with and such so that the interfaces work uh, in, in as open a way as possible. So we have to understand the BCI technology well enough. To, if we're going to make a role-playing game, a brain-computer face uh, augmented reality or virtual reality role-playing game that's completely controlled through your mind, we've got to understand the, the different layers of the components you know, that we're going to be programming with. So that's how this has to do. That's the ultimate in not just accessibility, but I think the ultimate in an immersive role-playing game. I mean, can you think of a more immersive role-playing game then if we get a multi-channel, you know, instead of just, you know, binary options, we eventually get it working so that you can do multiple options. Uh, an immersive VR, AR, BCI-controlled role-playing game. <laughs> I don't think you could make one, honestly. You don't think that's possible? Is it turn-based? Not I mean, more immersive than a BCI device would be. Oh, no, no. I, no, I was just saying, okay, so you're saying, yeah, you don't think you'd be more immersive than that. Okay. I thought you were saying we couldn't make it. I'm like, wait oh, a minute. We can definitely oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. And it'll be primitive at first, but we'll get better at it. Um, we're working towards that. So uh, there's the Cyton Biosensing Board, which has eight channels at, about, at $500. Again, doesn't come with all the other stuff to hook up. Then there's the do-it-yourself neurotechnologist starter kit. 
So this does come with, and um, you got two choices. You've got the eight channel for nine hundred fifty dollars, or the sixteen channel for fifteen hundred dollars. So it's it's getting up there, but considering how much it comes with, and, and it's not that bad. Um, because those these bundles come with uh, the the heads the sixteen so let's let's go with the more expensive sixteen channel one the fifteen hundred dollar one but it comes with the same thing just one's eight channels the other sixteen channel uh, a one size fits all uh, headset um, which is you know a, a sock basically uh, sight and plus daisy sixteen channel board the snap electrode cables. Um, foam solid gel electrodes 30 pack times two so you get 60 of those and dry comb electrodes um, okay but does not come with the optional optional battery or charger and so they recommend getting that and it looks like that's actually through a third party they don't actually make it themselves so I know what I need to budget for, but there's the then there's this one which I would love to, but holy moly, this is twenty five hundred dollars. But this is the all in one biosensing R and D bundle. That sounds like it has our name written all over it. <laughs> so this comes with the sixteen channel board, the Sight and Plus Daisy biosensing board sixteen channel, Ultra Cortex Mark for you know, the headset Pro assembled medium sixteen channel. Gold cup electrodes, header pin to touch proof electrode adapter, EMG snap electrode cables, the uh, foam solid gel electrodes 30 pack times two, several, several of these are times two, dry EEG comb electrodes 30 pack, MyoWare muscle sensor, pulse sensor heart rate monitor, open BCI EEG uh, headband kit, and 1020 paste jars 3 pack. So it's a complete kit for doing all, all our mad science activities. Um, on a 16 channel setup I would love to pull that off but it is possible to buy that piecemeal one at a time and that would be what I'd have to do like each month pick up another piece and slowly put something together this seems to have a lot more energy behind it now than the open EEG folks right the open EEG folks were kind of a previous generation um, you know and it was quite active 10 years ago now I'm looking at it, it looks like it's become more in legacy mode and that people have taken that tech and now the open BCI is the next, you know, they're using newer tech and such, but at a cost and they're being more commercial about it. Whereas the Olamex folks are being really, really affordable um, and not very commercial. They seem to be really totally in that open source. Remember I telling you the whole open source community seems to be becoming the, the younger generation of open source people seem to be much more mercenary than the previous generation. Yes. This is the whole reason why I'm having to abandon Plone and everything. These, these folks are coming in. They don't seem to actually understand what open source is actually about. Um, and, and the recent rise in popularity of the Mozilla license and the MIT license shows how much more mercenary it's become compared to what was previously the most popular license, which were the GPL licenses. Um, it's really quite astounding, the change in just 10 years. Uh, in attitude there. Uh, but anyway, uh, there is a Wikipedia entry about OpenBCI. What's funny is if you look up just regular BCI on Wikipedia, it, there isn't a bit large, it's a pretty short entry. But OpenBCI's entry is, uh, is, is a little bit longer. <laughs> Interesting. That's, and, that's really weird. Yeah. And then this OpenBCI text, so they got an example here of using it to control a hex bug robot using steady state visually evoked potentials locked in uh, a locked in graffiti artist so you know somebody who's paralysis and such is locked in uh, graffiti artist tempt one has used the open bci and the low cost eye writer eye tracking system to continue to draw after being diagnosed with degenerative nerve disorder als mm -hmm. so these are some real world awesome applications which are exactly what we've been talking about for years the potential to keep people's lives engaged rather than being you know trapped in 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 a body you know fully operational mind and trapped in a body so the open bci 32-bit board uses the ads 1299 and ic developed by texas instruments for bio potential measurements open bci uses a microcontroller for onboard processing the 8-bit version 
is now deprecated. 32-bit board uses a PIC microcontroller and can write the EEG data to an SD card or transmit it to software on a computer over a Bluetooth link. In 2015, OpenBCI announced the Ganglion board, so that's the one we were just reading about. The second, oh, it's through a Kickstarter campaign. It costs $200 and four input channels for measuring EEG, EMG, and EKG, and it's also Bluetooth enabled. So that's the thing, is it has a lot more features than the Open EEG, which is all hardwired, right? It doesn't have Bluetooth and all of that. But that four input channels is about the same as the Open EEG. So in theory, if I buy a second one of the Open EEG, I've got eight channels for 200 bucks. And in theory, if I bought four, we'd have 16 channels for 400 bucks compared to 1500. But without, you know, knowing there is pretty, it's much more kludgy, <laughs> right? It's much more low level than the OpenBCI stuff, which if you look at it is much sleeker. It's got some, you know, a lot slicker look to it. Um, very fascinated. And we'll have to put this on the on the to-do list when I can afford it. What I might have to do is just start with the four-channel board, and it looks like they'll stack. Because the way it looks like, they just literally stack them together. Wouldn't that be great? What Now, you guys are using the, what is it called again? Uh, we're using, they, they have Emotive and G-Tech. Yeah, let's take a look at those. Go Motive BCI and GTEC. Let's take a look at. It says get access. Why do I have to get access? Just tell me. Okay, here we go. Store headsets. Boy, GTEC site doesn't want to load. Come on. Oh, I gotta switch networks. I'm on. I'm on my DSL connection. <laughs> That's only 1.5 megabits. No wonder the website's been slow. <laughs> Let me switch networks. There we go. Okay, so that emotive Epoch 14 channel, is that the one or the 5 channel? Insight. Okay, so, so Motive Epoch Plus 14 channel is $800. The Motive Insight 5 channel, EEG, is 300 bucks. The Epic Flex Gel Sensor Kit is $2,000. The Epic Flex Saline, Saline Sensor Kit is $1,700, and they've got some extender. Huh. Okay. I was thinking I remember most of the stuff that the, they work with is just commercial grade. Right. Right. Hospital, whatever. Right. So you got that premium for being fancy. Yep. Oh, and they do. And they do look. They do look s slicker. Um, so GTEC is that the G Tech you're talking about, or is it G E G T E K? It's. I want to say E C. Okay, because one site is dead. Let me try another one. Um, uh, nope, not that one. That's Canadian, but not. Let me try. GTEC.AT, I believe, is the website. Okay, it was just because I switched networks. There it is. Okay. Um, so, how do you buy their stuff? I mean, where's their store? <coughs> do you know which headset it was? The iAutilus Pro Research Finners Multipurpose. I'm not sure. About These are the wearable. Model. I'll try the research one to see what it looks like. Wearable EEG. So it's a portable unit, so you can like walk around while monitoring data. That's good. But need more products? Send us your email so they won't tell you how much it costs. You have to. Let them spam you. I hate sites that do that. Oh, I hate that. You know, and they shove toothpicks up under your fingernails and ratchet them back and forth. Oh, I hate that. Don't you just hate that? <laughs> it's an old comedy routine. <laughs> yeah, any of the pricing, you have to email them for them to give you pricing. 
that doesn't bode well. <laughs> when it's manual like that, that's going to be pricey. Oh, uh, we get, got to get some funding. Got to get some funding. We did get some. Um, a, uh, a, a an organization. So Brooke, who's our vice chair. Uh, her boyfriend is part of some organization that they donated their overtime hours to a charity, and he talked them into donating it to us, the employees. So we got a check for $1,100 from them. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't think I'm going to be able to talk the board into using that to buy the EEG equipment. I think that's going to be so too far out for their vision to understand why that would be a value to RPG research now, right? We, as opposed to getting books and kits and stuff like that. And I can understand that. So that's fair. that is fair. So we need to set up a, an option for people to donate for our EEG BCI research. You know, the, it'd be all part of the ERPG division. The, the whole reason we're doing it, we have an ERPG division is because I want to see the realization of the ultimate in accessibility and immersion and that requires the, the layers of you know computer-based role-playing game you know designed all of that logic layer de developed with an input interface through bci and a visual interface through ar and vr those are the different components we need to research and develop and link those together to have what i hope to have someday um I still think the tabletop experience has huge advantages, but I also know the future is the electronic stuff and the AR and VR. And there's no reason why we can't be researching both areas simultaneously. We've got the here and now, and we've got the future, and that future is getting closer, and I want us to be part of it. Just like when I was researching the tabletop stuff of this clear back in 83, that was very early in the, in the realm of researching role-playing games and tabletop. Now there's all sorts of people piling on decades later. Same thing with BCI. Right now there's not a lot, but you can see the upwards, the, it's going up exponentially. And so I want us to still be involved with that related to role-playing games. Because I think, again, we'll be able to take the, the benefits of a role-playing game and the benefits of neurofeedback and such and, and link those two together to really have a maximal, incredible ability to help people have a better quality of life, whether it's through accessibility, socialization, or you know skills or, or other development, beneficial development and such. Um, so here's a study. I was pulling up some of my old papers and such uh, and my old resources um, just to... You may or may not be aware of some of this, so I thought I'd share some of it with you. Let me find the right... All right. Uh, so this was a piece on change in brain activity through virtual reality-based brain-machine communication in a chronic tetraplegic subject with muscular dystrophy. And I think this was from 2000... Either 10 or 15, let me find it. Are you familiar with that study at all? Does that sound familiar at all to you? Okay, it's on our www.2rpgresearch.com website. If you just search for uh, EEG. Yeah, here it is. So this is a Japanese group in 2010. Hashimoto, etc. Uh, et al. From Biomed Central. So abstract. For severely paralyzed people, a brain-computer interface provides a way of reestablishing communication. Although subjects with muscular dystrophy, and remember we've worked with the MDA uh, a fair amount, and in fact Brooke, who's now our vice chair, used to be in charge of the summer camps development for the MDA, and then she joined us after we did programs at the MDA for their camps. Um, although subjects with muscular dystrophy, MD, appear to be potential BCI users, the actual long-term effects of BCI use on brain activities in MD subjects have yet to be clarified. To investigate these effects, we followed... Uh, BCI use by a chronic tetraplegic subject with MD over five months. The topographic changes in an encephalogram EEG after long-term use of the virtual reality-based BCI were also assessed. Our originally developed BCI system was used to classify an EEG recorded over the sensorimotor cortex in real time and estimate the user's motor intention, MI, in three different limb movements, feet, left hand, and right hand. 
An avatar in the internet-based VR was controlled in accordance with the results of the EEG classification by the BCI. The subject was trained to control his avatar via the BCI by strolling in the VR for one hour a day and then continued the same training twice a month at his home. Results. After the training, the error rate of the EEG classification decreased from 40% to 28%. The subject successfully walked around the VR using only his motor intention and chatted with other users through a voice chat function embedded in the internet-based VR. With this improvement in BCI control event, Related desynchronization, ERD, following MI, was significantly enhanced. Um, uh, error of range of 0 0.01. Uh, for feet, MI from minus 29 to minus 55%. Left-hand MI from minus 23 to minus 42%. And right-hand MI from minus 22 to minus 51%. Conclusions. These results show that our subject with severe MD was able to learn to control his EEG signal and communicate with others through use of VR navigation and suggests that an internet-based VR has the potential to provide paralyzed people with the opportunity for easy communication. Isn't that awesome? It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's very, very cool. Yeah. So there was an earlier one I came across in, in 2007, which were, unless, unless this is it, I don't think this is it. It was Australia one. And I've had trouble finding that one, but that was where I was really getting stoked about all this. And that's when I started trying to buy the equipment and everything. Um, plus, I, you know, was w w part of neuro feedback and such through neuroeducation back in 2004. And I did experiments with uh, music therapy and other activities while hooked up to the EEG feedback equipment. Um, so the document is quite detailed. It goes into great detail about how they hooked up everything, how the controls work. Um, it, it really is, it, it, it's kind of a how-to manual for this kind of setup. And, and so for me, it's a great template of what could be done and needs to be done and, you know, needs more to be done. So um, did you find the document on the website? Okay, so if you go to www.rpcresearch.com, right, you got to go to the old archives. And you, I don't think you need to be logged in. I don't think it's you, members only. So in the upper right-hand search box, if you just type EEG, I think you should find a list. Okay, and then you'll... Um, scroll down to, let's see, um, I only have seven results for EEG. Really? I've seen two pages worth. On WW2. Yeah, but I guess because I'm logged in, I'm seeing more. Um, let me see if it's on, let me see where it is. Huh. I must have sublinked it. Let me, let me go back here and tell you what the page is. Okay, there's a 2007 paper. So there's my 2007 one, okay, that I wrote. Um, where's the link? 2010 abstract. Okay, how did I get to that PDF? You know, I can't find where I was. <laughs> Crap. Come on, Hawk. And it's gone. Did it ever exist? They still wonder to this day. I was just, I mean, I've got the document in front of me. But I'm trying to find, because I found it from my server. Okay. So look for... Let's try change in brain. Let's see if that finds it. Because I'm, I'm looking at the URL now. Change in brain. There it is. Type in, in the search box, type change in brain. Then you'll get the PDF. Okay, okay. That's, there it is. So download that PDF because it is chock full of really useful info. 
Now let's look at how outdated my old 2007 paper is, because it's fascinating to go back and look at my old stuff. <laughs> Let it load. There it is. So it was just a one-page, short, short essay I wrote in 2007, January 2007. Creative Program Ideas and Trends, Virtual Reality for the Disabled. Using virtual reality technologies to help those with various disabilities ex except blindness to engage in a virtual way in activities that would normally be very difficult if not impossible for them in the real world. Technology is quickly catching up to make this, I said that in 2007, I thought it would already be here by now. <laughs> it's still limping along. Technology is quickly catching up to make this a more and more viable option for recreation up to opportunities for people that would otherwise be extremely limited in their recreation choices. It could quite literally open up an entire new universe of possibilities. As technology becomes less intrusive and more transparent, as well as the cost less prohibitive, it will likely become a very effective tool both in recreation and rehabilitation, and the probable trend is that it will become more and more mainstream and adopted by a larger segment of the population each year, including both those with disabilities and those without. The goal of a virtual reality system is to place the user in a synthetically generated three-dimensional environment that he or she can directly manipulate. Ideally, users cease to think of themselves as interacting with the computer. They think of themselves as interacting with the environment it has created. Special input and output devices allow a user to interact with the virtual environment. These capture the user's motion and gestures and produce the sensory feedback from the synthetic environment to the user's vision, hearing, and touch. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I, I do some more quotes. Uh, perceive what lies in there. Virtual reality techniques can also be used in rehabilitation technology through com compensation of and motor and sensory deficits, allowing disabled person to explore and manipulate new environments. Has the potential to be used as a training aid for skills such as spatial coordination and orientation. Um, virtual helmet harnesses power of brainwaves. So this is this is from the this is from a 2006 article. Let's see if it's still around. Can I even click those links? Okay, I got 1999 Proceedings, 1995 Virtual. Where's the link? Okay, I probably got to... Come on, let me select it. It's not let me select the link. I do not want to have to type this in manually. Ah. I can see the link, but I can't, because it's in a PDF. I can't, and my viewer is being stubborn. I need a different viewer, I guess. Yeah. Or just find my ODT to this file. I bet it's in my folder here. Just go get that instead of hassling with the PDF. RCLS 385. All right. Uh, unusual recreation. I don't see it. Where is that hiding? All right. There we go. Backups. Cool. Okay, it's under the VR folder. Okay, that makes sense. Ish. <laughs> makes something. Oh, gosh darn it. There it is. 
Oh, but I only have my... P I don't know. Where's my original doc? This is only the PDF version of the little thing I made. I don't have... Oh, it's under my school folder. Okay. So I never copied it over to my RPG research folder. All right. So I got to go way down that chain. This 385. This is when I was doing RCLS programming. There it is. There's my ODT. Let's put that where... Stuff. Okay. Now I can get to that bloody link. <laughs> that was a lot of hassle. So this is okay. I mean, I think I've been misremembering because this is Austrian rather than Australian. <laughs> That's where my memory jumbled things a little bit. It was 2007. Give me a break, you know. <laughs> it's very similar. <laughs> That's the danger of memory. So this is this is a virtual helmet. Um, Allowed person to use their mind to help them control their wheelchairs, computers, and false limbs. Work of British scientists. Hooked up with VR. Paraplegic after a swimming accident. Tom Swiger injured in, a Greek, in Greece seven years ago. Uh, 31 years old. VR. University of College London. Asked researchers to think about moving either his foot or his hand. The signals, and, and so these are all that muscle uh, integration, MI stuff. Um, EEG, 3D glasses, <coughs> virtual cave. First, it all felt strange having the cap on and being asked to think about moving my feet, but gradually I felt as if, as if I was in that world. Uh, at one point, I completely forgot it was a virtual world, and I was part of this experiment. It was really interesting, much more enjoyable than I expected. Uh, Mel Slater, virtual environment, UCL, blah, blah, blah. Uh, ultimate goals give people such as Schweitzer more freedom in their everyday lives, according to scientist Robert Lieb of Graz University Technology in Austria. Okay, um, wow, but it's kind of missing, while well, it cites people, it doesn't have any reference links, that's a problem, um, let's see what if other sources I have here, I have some going back to 1995, Oh, and it's behind a paywall now. Great. Of course it is. Of course it is. Okay, 1999. Page not found town now, so I have to go through archive.org to find it. <sighs> so aggravating. Ooh, and that site's been hijacked by bad people. Uh, That's really unfortunate. And MSN's lost their link. So all the links I had are gone now. Gosh darn it. This is why this is why RPG research exists and why I do it the way we do it. We download copies and snapshots of these articles and content so that we can actually find them later. <laughs> Because they did exist, right? There's this whole internet scrubbing thing going on 
that's a nightmare, right? Ever since archive.org lost at the, in the, at the Supreme Court level, did you know about that? Archive.org was being sued by multiple companies for copyright violation for making backups of sites, right? Because the whole point of Archive.org was to preserve the Internet as it changed and grew exponentially and to preserve facts, right? Right. So that it was harder for people to pretend about what the past was, etc. Well, some companies started, to, newspaper agencies and stuff like that, started suing them because they said it was a copyright violation to have the archives of any of the content. And that the process of requesting removal was too cumbersome. So it escalated all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that no archive.org must remove content whenever it's asked. If you go to archive.org now, it has been gutted. There's so much content that used to be there. I know it used to be there because I was involved in some of that technology and stuff. And you cannot find those sites or content anymore. So there's a whole scrubbing of the web, which is to completely alter what happened in the past, right? Because people trust now what they get in Google, even though it's been totally distorted. And all these other things are being stuck behind paywalls, etc. So, and it makes long-term research, right? Because I have a very longitudinal view over decades. It makes longitudinal research really painful <clears throat> when they keep burying stuff. So that's why I started getting the habit of every time I found an article, a paper, essay, whatever it was, I made sure I downloaded a PDF copy, you know, printed print from page or something like that, so that I have the resource that I'm referencing. I can actually point to it, right? Say, no, this really existed. Because often, like this, I will find things that go, I cite it, and then you click the link, and it's gone. And you search Google, you cannot find the slightest trace of that article I, I cited. Something I wrote back in 2004, 2007, you cannot now find. <clears throat> or it's behind a paywall. And deeply deeply buried paywall and it makes it really hard to move research further forward when this happens right up until about 2010 12 um it was all moving forward at, at lightning speed because we had all this great sharing and then and then 2016 i really saw a huge change in people not sharing anymore and it's it's become ubiquitous i'm seeing it everywhere in the role-playing game community Right up till 2016, everybody was sharing with me everything, and I shared openly, and we were an open community, an open repository. And then all of a sudden, 2016, people started smelling money, and they have gone, no, mine, right? They're very close. Now, nobody has ever asked me to take anything down from our site. We've had lots of people say, hey, would you please post my research? Here's my paper. You know, it either got published or didn't get published. We have it was published in an open journal. But if it wasn't published, there's like, well, it never got published because I wanted it to be available. Would you publish it, you know, and still, still let me have my rights? And I'm like, gladly. So we've done that over the years. Well, up until 2016, that was a common occurrence where people submitted content to us to, to make freely available. Since 2016, that has dried up all but completely. It is a radical change in mentality in the, in the scientific community and specifically in the role-playing game community. And I don't know what to do other than build up our research stuff staff back up and get active again. My plan is to reach out to everybody. I was going to do it this week, but Brooke and I both agree we should wait until after the holidays when things aren't so hectic for people. So the first week of January, I'm going to be reaching out to all of our research team because we have a dozen people on our team, but you and I have been the only ones attending the last few meetings. I haven't even heard from Omar, who always was pretty good about attending. Now, ever since his house fire, that's pretty understandable. That really shook up his life. So I'm just kind of waiting for the holidays to wrap up. And then January, we're going to get on the phone and do everything we can to track everybody down and go, are you still participating or not? <laughs> You know, and if so, because I know like Jonathan wanted to change his participation level to be a little bit different, but he didn't want to stop participating. He just felt that, like you, that doing the, 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 the blogs and stuff was more than he could commit to because of his, 
being a professor at Michigan State, it was more than he could keep up with. Even though he really wanted to do it, he just had to make some compromises. But he still wants to be engaged. Um, you know, some of the other people had some life situations, like Omar's house fire or Angela's being in the hurricane that destroyed her home. <laughs> Things like that. We, we've, we've literally... What's that? No big deal. Right. We've literally lost uh, research participation because they're literally their houses have been wiped out. I'm like, that's understandable. But they've also said they don't want to be removed. They hope someday to re-engage. So I'm hoping that someday is the first week of January we get I, I track people down and get them re-engaged. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to have to build up a new team again because it's nobody's... I've got all this great research we need to do. I don't have anybody that I've, that's trained to hand it off to, right? You're the you're the only one that's still hanging around, thank goodness. I really appreciate it. Um, but uh, but we've also talked about the, the level of, of workload you can handle right now is, is limited. But at least you're attending these meetings, which really helps. It helps me to have somebody else to process these through with, and it helps us still keep this going until we can get the other teams showing up again. Um, Omar totally is interested in continuing he just the house fire really shook up his life um, and in fact he was trying to expand more than just research he wanted to start helping us with some of the marketing side because it turns out he works for an advertising company in Saudi Arabia <laughs> and he's like all this time he never said anything and then he saw my posting desperately trying to find a marketing manager he went oh I might mention that I work for <laughs> an advertising company <laughs> like yeah that would be helpful but then the house fire happened, and we haven't been able to move forward on that. So, anyway, uh, so it, it's distressing to see the open source community getting more mercenary than it used to be, and to see how regulation is interfering with the open EEG BCI stuff, right? And making it a lot more expensive or inaccessible. That's really distressing. So, that's all the more reason. I need to scoop up the equipment while I still can, right? Because once I've got it, we can use it. But if I wait too long, I'm afraid it's going to become inaccessible. So I think I'm going to try to... I can't do it during the holidays, but after the holidays, I'm going to try to pick up some of the open BCI equipment and, and slowly you know, build a kit, buy a little bit each month so that we have the newer open BCI stuff. We'll still have the open EEG stuff, and that gives us something to work with now. It helps me get all the software set up, etc., which I've been doing. I've been getting the computers set up because I was hoping you were going to be here. <laughs> I'll keep working on it. That's all right. I need more time anyway. So after Christmas, if we can get you up here um, and let you try out the, the open EEG stuff, I'll, I'll have the computers more dialed in anyway. And... Um, uh, but then, meanwhile, in January, I'll start getting the pieces of the the, the Ganglion Open BCI set up and work up to to a full kit, at least an eight channel, and maybe eventually sixteen channel. But at least try to work up to an eight channel kit, and then maybe extend that up to a sixteen channel later. And that should give us a lot to work with. You know, I've already got plenty of computer hardware here. The other piece I want to be able to tie in is robotics. For example, being able to pick up dice and drop dice and move miniatures and such through through BCI controls. I think that's probably something that can happen. Yeah, maybe through does does Legos does the Legos robotics have a BCI hookup? I used to teach Legos robotics at at St. George's, but that was a long time ago, so I don't know if. I know they've had advances. Do you know if they've added any BCI interface to the Lego robotics stuff? I uh, don't, but I bet it could be done. Let's see. Robotic and virtual reality BCIs using spatial, tactical... VR, BCI, it's all just VR, it's not robotics. Okay, so Mindstorm is what they call it. So let's try Brain, Computer, Interface, Mindstorm, Lego. Lego EV3 Robot Control Interface Brain Mapping. Brain Avatar Lego EV3 Robot Control Interface. 
who says your brain avatar has to be bottled up inside a computer with the brain avatar Lego interface. Your brain waves come out into the real world and interact with you to teach your brain self-regulation optimal brain states without having to use a computer screen. Brain Avatar introduces an interface to Lego Mindstorm EV3 series of robotic designs and control kits. Clients can design their own robots or use. All right, so it exists. There's some videos here. It's on brainavatar.com, the future of brain biofeedback and imaging. Okay, let's... Uh, bookmark that <laughs> it's brainavatar.com interesting and so the sub page is forward slash well if you just do a web search for brain computer interface mindstorm lego it's like the second link down lego ev3 robot control interface that'll be a faster way to get you to it Did you find it? It's got videos and everything. Uh, the brain avatar? The, the, the Lego EV3 robot control interface page. Uh, the one from Lego? Or the education.lego? So it's Lego EV3 robot control interface, brainavatar.com forward slash Lego dash EV3 dash robot dash control dash interface dot HTML. You want me to pop? Yeah, let me drop it in Jitsi. I'll pop in here. Let's see. Sorry. All good. There's the URL. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Gosh darn it. Got the wrong... I clicked on the wrong one. Sorry. You already know about that one. <laughs> Here's the URL. <laughs> So yet another way I would like to tie in BCI with RPGs is the ability to roll physical dice because physical dice have a very different emotional experience as well as random you know, as well as randomization compared to computer generated randomization, and then being able to move miniatures around on the board. So it's a way for somebody with you know significant impairments to participate in the physical tabletop war game world and get all the social benefits but still have uh, self-autonomy rather than dependence on other people doing it for them, right? Instead of letting others roll the dice for them and others move the miniatures for them, this would be a great way to add that uh, self-sufficiency and, and interaction and inclusiveness. And the Lego Robotics uh, mind, uh, uh, Mindstorm stuff is pretty easy. As I said, I used to teach it during summers at, at St. George's and stuff. So that's pretty cool stuff. So it's great to see that there's an interface. Now, did you say that Lego has their own BCI interface that you found? No, I, I okay. don't know of anything like that. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, luckily some third party did. made it. What's that? I wish they did have a yeah. proprietary. It seems like something Lego would do. Yeah, I'm only seeing third-party creators. Be interesting if we find one. Here's a Wolfram ResearchGate. 
Here's an Emotive Epoch plus NXT Mindstorm 2.0 BCI. That was on, now it's Daily Motion, but... So I don't know. <laughs> but they got a video of... Yeah, so they're using the the um, the epoch that you guys were using to control a Lego an NXT Mindstorm 2.0 robot. A little video of that four five minute four and a half minute video. It's not the greatest site because it's on daily motion, but if we could find the original, there's the URL for it. Yeah, I definitely want us to have, uh, you know, development in this area ongoing with RPG research. Just we got to have the volunteers active for that to happen. Robot control through brain-computer interface for pattern recognition study from 2018. Okay, I'm downloading that. Using the BCI 2000 platform, that's what you guys are using, right? I thought that was one of the ones he mentioned in the site, but maybe not. Maybe I'm conflating. Okay. Anywho, well, that's a bummer. None of those links work now, except that one. I better make a copy of that one. Well, fascinating stuff, huh? is there's just so much going on that there is no collaboration and so every time you want to do something you have to build it from the ground up basically right you have to piece together other softwares or you have to you know figure out someone else's vision right another thing that we, we really want to do is make tools that add to the accessibility of creating for different types of hardware.
What's that? Just all this stuff that's on here. Yeah. On the av a brain avatar one? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's fun it's funny how we stumble across these things, but this is this is why it's important to do these things because that then it expands our, our horizons and knowledge and all of that, so that's why it's important to keep doing this. Well, I'm sure we're making for exciting video viewing now. <laughs> Dead air. <laughs> the excitement of research. <laughs> Dead air. But if you could see inside... Yeah, if you could see inside of our minds... <laughs>
um, <laughs> the silence is deafening. <clears throat> Are you, have you gone down the rabbit holes? Yeah, I'm looking through all of this brain afterwards. Let me, let me give you one more rabbit hole to enjoy. I was enjoying this a little while ago. So something you can chew on at your leisure. I think you'll also enjoy that. Maybe you're already aware of it, actually. You might already be fully aware of this, but I was enjoying it. Uh, okay, there it is. In Grammatron, are you familiar with this? No. The, um, so Dr. Stephen R. Campbell, um, Educational Neuroscience and Mixed Research Laboratory in the Faculty of Education at Simon Fraser University in Grammatron. The Canada Foundation for Innovation's New Opportunities Program has provided Dr. Stephen R. Kemble with funding, and this is this was a few years ago, uh, but anyway, uh, funding to establish a mathematics educational neuroscience laboratory, a.k.a. the Engrammatron, one of the world's first facilities specifically designed for and de dedicated to research in educational neuroscience. Fully operational in the fall semester 2006, the Engrammatron is envisioned to serve as a magnet facility for the Educational Neuroscience Group for Research into Affect and Mentation in Mathematics Education, Ngram slash ME. The Engrammatron uh, aims toward accommodating needs of Ngram research associates more generally beyond this primary specialization in mathematics education. In Grammatron facilities enable simultaneous observation and acquisition of audio data from talking aloud reflective protocols, video data of facial and bodily expression, and real-time screen capture. Instrumentation most notably supports multi-channeled EEG, electrocardiography, electromyography, and eye tracking capability. Orbiting this constellation of observational methods around computer-enhanced learning platforms allows for unprecedented flexibility of educational research, experimental design and delivery, and for subsequent data integration and analysis. The Engrammatron will help establish educational neuroscience as a rigorous and humanistically oriented area of science inquiry, connecting the fields of cognitive neuroscience, which is part of my background, and educational psychology. Ngram slash ME investigations are initially focused on improving mathematics teacher education and instructional design of computer assisted learning in ways that teachers and students alike can learn mathematics in less threatening and more gratifying manners and in ways that will enable learners to gain deeper aesthetic appreciation for and conceptual understandings of mathematics and its applications. The Engrammatron will provide Ngram slash ME members and Ngram associates more generally with means to quantify learning human minds slash bodies in action. Aspirations for the Engrammatron include expediting and establishing international affiliations, collaborations, and developing expertise and highly trained personnel in this important and potentially foundational new area of educational research. For more info, call, email, etc. So there's a lot more, but that's the about part I figured would give you a good summary. What do you think of that? That sounds awesome. Yeah. Indeed. So, um, still nailing down the date, but it looks like, you know about RPG Conference, right? That we're putting that together as well? For the summer? Yes. Okay. Okay. And it's going to be at Eastern Washington University, and it's we've got it down to two different weeks. We're just trying to nail that down now. It's either going to be, and we're trying to get it for three days. So it's either going to be July 3rd, 4th, and 5th, or July 10th, 11th, and 12th. So one of those weekends. So the first or second weekend of July. Okay, that's what we're trying to nail down, which one it is. And I've got Kohei Kato already interested in coming out here. He'll stay at my house uh, for about for up to six days. Um, we've got to get visa and everything straightened out. But he, he's already, remember Kohei Kato's the one who's done that really good research on autism spectrum and role-playing games? Yes. He's agreed to come out and speak. That's great. So we're, we just got to nail down the date, and then we'll start making that happen. And remember, I'm trying to get five or more speakers from outside of RPG research in addition to any of our RPG research folks who are, well, who are ready to present on a topic. So, for example, if you wanted to present on your background on bleed that you've been learning more about, that would be great. Um, you know, 60 to 90 minutes or however long you need, but, you know, whatever, whatever amount you want. Because we'll have... 
The nice thing about us controlling it is we have 100% flexibility over the schedule. <laughs> so um, I want people to be able to present in the way that they feel is the most effective to get the message across. I get very frustrated with the arbitrary 15-minute, 30-minute, you know, limits that a lot of places set. And I, and, I, and I don't like the lack of depth that happens when you force them to summarize that at a, such a high level. Um, I want us to be able to geek out on the deeper details, right? That's why the RPG conference, you know, will hope be the world's first role-playing game research conference um, that's focused on role-playing games, right? There's other game study conferences out there. But I want to narrow the scope so that we can go deeper dive and get all everybody talking to each other in depth again, right? This was happening in 2016, and then everybody got mercenary. I want to see if we can break down those barriers and get everybody talking again so that we can move the, the industry as a whole forward better. So second, first or second week of July, we got to nail that down. So, you know, there'll be an evening session, you know, because it allows people to fly in either Thursday or first part Friday. Then we have an evening session, then we have all day Saturday, and then we have a Sunday session up until early afternoon. And then that lets people catch their flights out of town and such. So it's meant to work around people's work schedules and travel schedules. Because I have experience doing this with Tolkien Moot and such, and that's how you get better. You know, typically Friday is a little light on attendance, and Sunday is a little light on attendance, and Saturday is the heaviest day. But there, it, it's nice to have all three of those days to get everybody to have the maximal experience because what i found is if you only do one day people say it's not worth it to come out from another country for one day but if it's three days it's worth it to them to come out so <laughs> that's why we do it that way because it, it helps maximize trying to get people out here so once i have that date actually locked in with facilities uh, calendar um, then i'm going to start talking to other researchers around the world that i want to try to get to show up as well but Kohei Kato is number one on the list. He he has some of the best hard numbers for autism spectrum and role-playing gaming that I've found anywhere. Um, we'll have to get an interpreter from uh, the Mukagawa folks because his English is not strong. He can write it, but to be up on stage, he's, we're going to need an interpreter. Um, but that's okay. I, I want this to be a nice international experience, so <laughs> we'll make it work. Uh, but the good news is we have it nailed down, right? And, and now it's going to be tough because it's going to be close to when we have to take off for Gen Con, right? It's going to be back-to-back, -back and I'm going to have to move Tolkien Moot either a month earlier or a month later. We won't push it to October, but it might have to happen. Tolkien Moot would have to happen in June or August instead. Um, but at least it won't be totally pushed off. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's happening. We're really close to happening. Emily uh, Messina, who's professor at EWU, has been hounding the facilities guys to get these things nailed down. And the facility will handle up to 100 attendees. If we go above that, it gets too expensive. If we stay below it, it's pretty cheap. But, they, but apparently they're going to charge us $5 a person. So we'll have to pass that cost on to attendees or something. We'll have to figure out how to. Or, you know, maybe our donation costs will cover it. We'll see. We just need to, we'll have to budget for it <clears throat> one way or the other. Um, but that's good news. That is. Getting closer on that. Everything's moving forward. We're going to have a busy summer. Oh, yeah, but hopefully less chaotic, right? This this past summer was so chaotic because of the wedding, and it was, things popped up last minute, right? Gen Con, we had like four days' notice, and we took off, right? It was it was very last minute that we were going to Gen Con, and then we had everything else to juggle between uh, uh, Spokon and just it was too much. It was way too much, and Atra and all of that. It was too much. This time we're planning the year out. We're gonna have a very busy July, August. You know, June, July, August is still gonna be busy, but it's gonna be planned. We're gonna have it worked out in advance. My biggest fear is we're not going to have enough volunteers for Gen Con to make it happen. That's my only, you know, enough game masters. That really, really worries me. We have all these people, so we've got to get them engaged. And so we're going to go with the smallest. He's, he's offered us, we can go out, he's offered us up to a 26-table room. But I'm only taking the four-table room because I'm worried about volunteers getting to Indianapolis, showing up, and, and committing and running tables because we've got to have if you have four tables you need at least you know 12 gms to rotate on shifts 
And so we're going for 20 so that we avoid burnout. But I'm worried about... I'm pretty sure we can get 8. I'm worried about getting 12 to 16. And 20 we're shooting for because then that would be easy on everyone. But I'm very worried about the people's follow-through. I want to sign up 20 because I'm worried about attrition. Right? <laughs> if I sign up 8 and we lose one, we're doomed. If I sign up 20 and we lose one, we can get by. It's going to be a push. Yes. To, to find people and get people committed. Yes. Well, that's the hardest part is the commitment. But lots of people are excited about it because they get free. Jet. So if they if they run three sessions, basically, three, four-hour sessions, that covers the... They get a free Gen Con pass, which is 110 bucks. And then they can then go use it anywhere in Gen Con. So that's one incentive. Um, and then they're giving us free facilities and free marketing and advertising. And then a limited number of hotel rooms, right? One or two hotel rooms. Um, so that we can, we can house a few people. But... Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, but we have to give, deal with the transport and feeding them part. So, and one of the things we're looking at that David's looking into is possibly instead of driving the RPG bus and trailer and SUV to Gen Con and worrying about a breakdown of the vehicles, um, maybe putting them on a train and riding with the train to see if that's cheaper. Or even if it's the same cost, we can work while we're en route on the train, right, instead of driving. It's the peace of mind of knowing that you don't have to worry about the mechanical issues. Especially the bus breaking down, exactly. And then on the drive back, we drive, unless it's a lot cheaper, we drive back to, because the RPG tour is a really good publicity thing and community engagement thing. So we drive back, but there's less pressure on the drive back. If we break down, it's not the end of the world. If we broke down going to Gen Con, we could miss Gen Con. But on the way back from Gen Con, if we break down on the way back, you know, if we get stuck somewhere for a week, it's it's a hassle, but it doesn't destroy our schedule. So we're, right. we're seriously looking at the train option, but there's a lot of hidden costs that we have to watch out for. Yeah, yeah, and if we get a, a group rate, then, you know, a whole bunch of us might go. We'll see. Um, so anyway, that's happening, too. <laughs> Here's the current draft of... Events we're going to have at our tables. Let me pull this up and then we got to let you go, actually. I just saw the time. Um, yep. 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 own folder that's why okay boy I need to finish that document all right so here's the tables right so one session is four hours um, the day before Gen Con Wednesday is trade day we've been asked to attend that and do a workshop for the librarians and educators and then do a workshop for the retailers so that's Wednesday. That doesn't need, need a bunch of game masters. That just means us to do presentation and hands-on programs. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so the last couple of days of July, first couple of days of August, that's the main Gen Con proper. And so we'll have a, our own room of four tables with, with and space. And so at our tables, at some point, we will offer international games, accessible games for deaf and hard of hearing using American Sign Language, Accessible games using uh, for people with visual impairments in partnership with Dots RPG. They've already said they'll help with, with running a visually impaired table. So that's good. Remember, I'm on their board, too, so that helps. Um, 
accessible games, brain computer interface, tabletop games, hopefully in partnership with your neural matrix friends. Hopefully they can follow through with that. So they'd be running that table. We'd have, you know, some of the other, like BFRPG, because of the wonderful freedom of that game and availability of it. Uh, a lot of people aren't aware of it. We'd be running games with that. We'll run some Doctor Who. We might, if I can get it done, be running our first prototype of the BRPG, the Become RPG that I've talked about, of our own design. We might be able to debut an early version of it at, at Gen Con. We'll have an introductory uh, hands-on experience with the educational use of tabletop RPGs. We'll have an introductory hands-on experience with therapeutic use of tabletop RPGs. We might be running Kids on Bikes. We might be running Bubble Gum Shoe. Um, we might be running some of the Diceless game sessions. Um, those are some of the, the different tabletop sessions I've got queued up. Um, the International Games one could be multiple tables or just one table. It just depends on how many people and games we get lined up for it. But that will be a room with games that are not at conventions anywhere else ever, right? <laughs> right. So um, I've got to get him this list and get his feedback on that. But uh, it's coming together with, with, with if you guys, you know, if, if Neural Matrix folks are able to follow through and run a table and Dots RPG can run a table, and then we've got the other two tables that were, you know, it's, it's going to be, uh, so three sessions, um, you know, is 12 hours total out of four days. Um, and so we're hoping we'll just rotate through, and then people can go off and enjoy. Now, John, Danielle, and I will be out. We're sp uh, Derek says we shouldn't be hanging out there. We should be hanging out, meeting people, schmoozing, being on interviews, things like that. So that's what he suggests John, Danielle, and I be doing. However, if we can't get enough GMs, we'll be there running tables. We'll do whatever we have to do. Um, to make this happen but he would like us to see us ramp up over the next three to four years to a hundred plus person room and they'll provide ideal. they'll provide that for free as long as we keep you know providing enough gms to make it happen and keep having unique experiences so a lot to do good stuff though Yep. Uh, anything you want to comment on or ask about before we bid to do for the day? Uh, no, I get in touch with you closer toward holidays being over to mm -hmm. make sure I can schedule and figure out when to get over there. Okay, great. Please do. And, um, and if, if Eli hasn't contacted you, I suggested he would send you a a message or two in regards to Gen Con and please please hound him I need to know if I can count on him um, but it sounds like he's, I, he's a go it's just hammering out the details right right and then I would have thought he would already message you nope but I will double check with him please do please do because I'm, I'm about to send this email to Gen Con today with the tentative plan and I have on there tentatively that that he, Eli is going to be helping with the BCI table. So I'm planning to run a BCI table one way or the other, but it would be optimal if Eli and company were, or you know were running it. That would be far better. So um, and and it will also look good to Gen Con that we're bringing in these partner organizations. Now, were you guys talking about incorporating? Are you talking about incorporating as a for-profit or non-profit? Okay. We're not sure. Okay. Yet. <laughs> All right. If you need any guidance on that, especially the nonprofits, I mean, I've, you know, I have four for profit businesses and one nonprofit. So I actually have less experience with nonprofit than for profit, but I now have a ton of experience with nonprofit and I helped Dots RPG get their nonprofit launched. Helped them with getting everything ready and getting it in place. And there were some hiccups along the way and. Um, so I can certainly help you guys th through a scoping process, figure out which would be more appropriate for profit or nonprofit, depending upon where you guys see yourselves wanting to go in the future. So if we want to schedule a meeting some point down the road to help at an advisory level, I'd be happy to do so. Cool. I will keep that in mind. And if you guys are looking to build a board, I would love to participate in that as well. If you need board members. 
Because if you incorporate, you have to have board members. If you just do an LLC or something, that's different. But if you do an actual incorporation, whether it's for-profit or non-profit, you have to have a board. You have to have at least a, a president, secretary, and treasurer, and then a board of directors and such, a chair, and then uh, board members. So, love to help. Yeah, Eli's messaging me back. Uh, okay. His wife was all weekend, so he just didn't have time. Okay, understandable. There's been a lot of sickness going around, so that's understandable. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, he'll, I, it's on his radar, and he'll get back to you once he, when he can. Understood. All right, wonderful. You have a good one. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. No problem. You have a wonderful holiday and. Good holiday. Yeah, I'll, I'll still be slamming, except for except for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. I'm going to be working hard on trying to get all these pieces. I'm trying to get all these things finished before January, because January is the deadline. <laughs> so, right. there's a lot to do. Well, be well. Have wonderful, happy holidays. Uh, will I see you before New Year's, or will it be after New Year's? Likely not until after. All right, well, then have a happy New Year. Thank you. You as well. All right. Take care. I'll see you. Goodbye. Bye. And those of you watching, whether you're live or recorded, remember, 50, uh, remember RPG Research is a 501c3 nonprofit studying the effects of all role-playing game formats and their potential to help improve lives around the world. And, uh, you know, sometimes the process is not really exciting, but it's an important process to keep these things moving along and to improve lives. Uh, so if you would like to help support us, you can always volunteer by going to rpgresearch.com forward slash volunteer. Or we really need donors to help cover costs, for example, like that BCI equipment we're talking about. Or our community programs and the books and pencils and, and dice and paper and everything that we need to keep running those programs. Or our other many research projects that we're doing or our hosting and administrative stuff. Uh, if you would like to donate... Uh, you have several options. First of all, you can go to rpgresearch.com forward slash donate. You can do it through PayPal, either one time or subscription. Or if you'd like early access to these videos and a lot of other content, blog postings, news postings, essays, etc., that are often available to our Patreon supporters a month or more before the public, you can sign up through Patreon at patreon.com forward slash rpgresearch. Or, uh, but wait, there's more. <laughs> uh, you can swing by smile.amazon.com and select RPG Research as your charity of choice. And then as long as you shop at smile.amazon.com, it's the exact same website, uh, but you have to go there. If you go to www, it doesn't count. But you go to smile.amazon.com, uh, a small percentage of all your purchases, so Christmas shopping, year-long purchases, etc., will be donated to RPG Research and help us out. And every quarter we get a small check that, as more people do this, will slowly grow. And that's a really easy way for you to donate without it costing you anything. So please do consider that option at smile.amazon.com. It doesn't cost you any extra. Amazon then just kind of matches and contributes a certain small percentage. And the more people do that would really help us out. So wherever you may be, be well, happy gaming, and namadier.